Welcome, everybody. We're excited to be here to present about Nemesis. Our talk is titled Nemesis, uh, D Fighting Data with Data. To start things off, uh, we want to Give it a second, I think the slides are, there we go. There we cool. go, all right. Start things off, just introduce ourselves a little bit. Um, both Will and I, we, we work at a company called SpectreOps, which is a, it's a consulting company. We also have a, a product called Bloodhound, widely used for attack path mapping by both red teamers and defensive teams. Um, as for myself, my name is Lee Christensen. I go by Tifkin on Twitter. Um, I'm, I was actually born and raised here in Utah, so I can actually say I, was, I grew up in Harrisville. Usually nobody knows where that is, but it's, <laughs> up in Ogden if you don't happen to know where that's in. Um, but I, I come from a AppSec background. I grew up hacking games and then made my way into uh, the network security where I've been doing pen testing and red teaming for several years. And now I do security research here at Spectre Ops full time along with Will. Yeah, my name is Will Schroeder. My handle is HarmJoy on Twitter, GitHub, and all the socials. Uh, you may know me from such projects as Veil Framework, Empire. I was a contributor to PowerSploit for a period of time, one of the founders for Bloodhound. I also worked on uh, Ghostpack and worked on the Active Directory Certificate Services, the certified pre on research with Lee that we released a couple years ago for all that ADCS ponage. I'm a veteran conference speaker. Uh, I've trained a lot at Black Hat and things like that. So I've been doing this a while. And this, we're super excited about this project. Uh, really happy to talk to you about, uh, talk about it with you guys. But we wanted to acknowledge the other big principal developer for the project, Maxwell Harley. Uh, he wasn't able to be here today, but he also worked at SpectreOps with us and is a big, big contributor to the project. Cool. So what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to talk a little bit about some of the, the challenges we have as red teamers or when we're trying to attack a network. So we do a lot of pen testing, a lot of offensive engagements trying to attack networks. So there's challenges that arise from this that we want to go over. Uh, we're going to talk about what Nemesis is, what its vision and what its goals are. Uh, we're going to be diving into a little bit about some of the difficulties with uh, offensive data collection. Uh, we'll dive into a bunch of demos of Nemesis in action, and then ending, concluding with talking about why all of this actually matters. But first, red team story time. And of course, it wouldn't be a presentation in 2023 if I didn't have an AI-generated mind journey picture that I generated a few hours ago. But um, we've been operators for a long time, you know, at least we're probably like 20 years of experience plus between us. We've been focusing, we focused on breaking into kind of corporate Fortune 1000 networks. So we've seen a lot of different things over a period of time. Um, we have, we've seen a lot of challenges and like workflows and how we actually operate. So I'm gonna go through just a couple of little short kind of representative stories for typical op headaches that we've tended to have on a lot of our engagements. So the first one, um, I'm also, for a lot of these demos and these things, I'm gonna be showing a tool set called Cobalt Strike. It's a commercial red teaming tool set that we've just been using for a long period of time. But you know, this is gonna apply whether you're using Interpreter, Cobalt Strike, Sliver, or any other kind of uh, offensive C2 framework. So let's see, we have our file listing, like one of the super common things we tend to do on offensive engagements, no matter what the actual engagement is, is file share mining or data store mining. Pulling files down, having to process, process them, finding either vulnerabilities or that little interesting bit of information in a document that actually lets us achieve our objective. So we see here, we saw an interesting program data exe. It's gonna be some kind of Windows program probably. We're gonna download it. And then what are the next steps? Well, it's synced to the Cobalt Strike data store. So we have to go to that, open up a different tab, take this and sync all the files down actually to our operator workstation to do kind of that level one analysis. The common types of things you know, we'll always do, at the XXD strings, like that first kind of base level triage, right? We're not talking about reverse engineering or anything crazy at this point. We just want to figure out what this file is, right? We see, okay, it's a mono, it's a .NET assembly for Microsoft Windows. This is something we like to go after very commonly because we tend to find vulnerabilities in them. Like, okay, then I need to take this assembly and I need to move it to a different isolated separate Windows analysis VM because I can't run DNSPY or a lot of my .NET deserialization analysis when I'm actually on a Linux box. So then I need to open up a different VM, actually copy this over, sync everything over, do some level one file triage there, potentially open it in DNSPY, crawl through lots of different bits of source code and maybe eventually find a vulnerability. Here, for example, it has an arbitrary like JScript execution kind of issue in this file. So these are lots of different steps because if we have to do, the, it's not too bad to do it once, but if we have to do it 100,000 times throughout an engagement, not actually 100,000 times, but usually hundreds of times at least, this starts to get very uh, monotonous to where 
we're not able to do that same level one of triage across every file that we see. We kind of have to pick and choose because we're having to triage our time. So that's just one kind of small example of something we have to do repeatedly. Um, another kind of similar op story is let's say we have our file listing again. We see a secret document docx. Seems like it might be interesting. We download it through our agent, goes to the C2 server. We have to open up different tabs again, sync everything down again to our actual op VM that we're actually operating on. Then we have to take that document. We're going to run our file stuff. We're assuming it's an Office document, but we see it's encrypted. CDF v2 encrypted. This is something that happens not infrequently. I'm like, OK, well, do I have anything in my tool set to actually pull hashes out of this or crack this? Like, no, I don't at this particular time. I'm going to go pull everything up and search and say, OK, this isn't John the Ripper. There's an office to John. I'm going to pull that Python file down, install the dependencies, extract everything out. So we see our you know, Python 3 office to John. We're actually running it. And we get a representative hash that we can actually crack. But then, oh, yeah, we try to crack it just in our actual op VM, and we don't have John installed. We need to take this hash. We have to move it off to our actual hash cracking rig. And again, these are, this is not um, impossible. This is how we've you know, just kind of always operated. But there's lots of little steps here that we have to do over and over and over again. This just takes time. It adds up an aggregate when you're triaging hundreds or thousands of files on engagements. Um, the one last kind of little one, if anyone's familiar, DP API, the data protection interface. Uh, this is, uh, there's lots of moving parts here. I'm going to talk about this in one of the demos. I'm not going to go over everything right now. Because for anyone familiar, there are blobs that are linked to master keys. There might be state keys for Chrome um, that are then blobs or state keys are protected by master keys, master keys that are then protected by a user password and domain DP API backup key. And there's lots of different interlinked pieces of information to, to keep that all organized and set in one case can be difficult. So just lots of moving pieces, lots of things to keep track of. And obviously, these little examples are going to be a bit of foreshadowing for what we're going to show in some of the demos. But also complicating all of this, all these previous stories, is that most offensive tools the output, the tool data, is unstructured text. You know, we have our Rubius, Kerberos, and stuff up there. We got some interpreter, PostX. We have Impact down on the top and the bottom left uh, doing some secret stump and things like that. We have PowerShell output from PowerView for Git Domain Computer. All of these things are in, un that's just flat text, right? So this is because humans are normally the consuming party for these tools, not an automated process. This is in, particularly in PostX. For things like OSINT, for network mapping and all that, there have been structured forms of this data for a long period of time. But for offensive tools specifically, normally it's just when operators are using them. So offensive analysis, in our view, has definitely been hampered by this unstructured and ununified data sources. And I mean ununified in that there might be the same bit of data that is covered are the same like, say, you're enumerating services or something in different places. You might be getting linked interesting pieces of information that you have to link manually. We actually have a whole post about this called Unstructured Data that's linked to off the Nemesis repo. And really kind of what we're getting to is, you know, InfoSec, we've been looking at a lot of raw data logs, thinking this is data analysis. But our argument, part of the argument, is that structured data is far superior to like just straight console-based log files, and we're going to hopefully convince you why. And this is kind of a common theme you know, in InfoSec. We really should have hired uh, some more proper software engineers. A lot of the tools that we've written and people have used <laughs> over the past couple of decades have been written by hackers. I've written a lot of code. I am not a software engineer, so things like CI, CD, or unit testing, and this, and code coverage, and stability, and all that. You know, like these are often proof of concepts that get put online that people end up adopting. So uh, this is just kind of a common theme to where, you know, in particular with this whole thing, like offensive enri or data enrichment pipelines are not a new concept, but uh, they haven't really been applied to InfoSec yet. So in addition to some of these challenges, uh, one other challenge that we have is tradecraft is difficult to scale. So new tradecraft is coming out, or like daily, or when we're on assessments, we discover new tradecraft due to the technology that's in our customer's network, or maybe the specific custom software that they have there. So there, when we learn a new technique, you know, we have 20 to 30 people on our team. And so when something new comes out, how do we kind of distribute that knowledge to an entire team uh, so that they can use it on their own assessments? And that, that's a hard problem. Like you can use training, but that's only so good. You can, you can do exercises, but that takes time and it takes money to train everybody up. So how can we scale up knowledge as new things happen? Um, 
as, as Will alluded to, offensive data also isn't unified. So there's several, uh, when we do engagements, sometimes we use upwards to like four different C2 frameworks. We might be using, you know, Meterpreter, Cobalt Strike, Mythic, Sliver, you know, Stage 1, Nighthawk, whatever. There's all these different C2 frameworks out there. And ultimately, they all kind of do the same thing. They are, they're issuing commands and you're collecting data and then you analyze it. The problem is, is, uh, all of it, all of this da data is siloed. So it's going to be in Mythic's database. It's going to be on the Cobalt Strike team server. So there's no like central view to where you can go to see all of the data associated with an, with an assessment, like what's been done and what's going on, like what is the state of the network based off of all of the data that we've collected so far from several different tools. We also might be running things like command line tools on, a, on an op. So, you, you know, I might run an, an, an maps scan or something. And that's just stored on my own local workstation. And my other team members can't see what I've been doing unless I upload it somewhere and like tell them that I've been doing this. Um, Another one is that you know we have we're we're triaging files and we're triaging the output of all these tools that we're running, and you know when I look at the output of a tool or when I look at a file, I look at it very differently than than Will does. So if, for example, I have a much bigger background in like VR. So when I'm looking at a PE file, I might be able to find vulnerabilities a little bit easier than maybe Will can because he has a different set of skill sets. He's much better at Active Directory stuff. So maybe you know when he's triaging Active directory, he's going to have different insights that I might not have. So there's inconsistencies in how we analyze things. And that's not necessarily a, a bad thing. It's just a reality that we each know things that the other person doesn't does. Um, so we want to try and address these things uh, uh, with a tool, which is, you know, Nemesis. So what are some of our goals? Well, we want to... Um, we want to empower each operator's analytic capabilities. So one way that we're going to do this is by building an offline network model. So right now, most tools that you run, they, they need a live network in order to get an idea of what's going on. And so what we want to do is we can still run collection tools, but we want to build an offline model of that network so that if we lose access to that network or no longer are there, maybe you know incident responders kick us out for a while, we still have all that data aggregated and we have a model of what's going on in that network and we can query and run tools against that model instead of having to have a live network for our tools to work. Um, another thing that we want to do is automatic and consistent analysis of known common data types. So a very simple example of this that in our first target is file files. So I'd say on like 90% of the time when we are triaging file shares or looking at files on, on the file system, you're going to find something valuable, whether that's a password, maybe it's just how the, infra, the, the, the network is structured, you'll find network diagrams, you'll find documents describing the processes that are used. And so this data is very useful, but it's not you know, aggregated and again, people may look at it very differently and get, and get different insights. Uh, we also want to provide workflow specific triage functionalities uh, to help assist operators. So you can kind of think of this like uh, almost kind of like Clippy for uh, pen testers and red teamers. You know, if as, as pen testers and red teamers, we go through different workflows. So you may do OSINT, you might be doing local privilege escalation, Active Directory privilege escalation, discovery, trying to look for certain kinds of documents. And uh, we can, we want to be able to create tooling that assists operators during each one of these specific workflows um, based off of this, net, this offline model that we've created. Another long-term goal of this is to enhance our, our knowledge sharing and our coordination and, and ultimately reporting. So um, as part of this, uh, as we're collecting all this data and performing our assessments, um, you know, when we're going through each phase of an assessment, we can give suggestions based off of uh, the data that we've collected so far. So a simple example of this might be, uh, let's say I'm, I, I get access to, I compromise a user's machine, and we do a process listing. And well, we can automatically see maybe what EDR products are on that 
that endpoint or the AV that's on that endpoint. And based off of previous knowledge, we may know that some tools don't work against you know, a certain AV or a certain EDR product. And so before an operator runs that command, we can actually block that execution. Or maybe we can give suggestions of like, oh, like you should look, if you live out of this specific directory, for whatever reason, this EDR product excludes um, scanning of that directory. So you're like kind of home free to operate and do whatever you want as long as you're in that directory. Um, we want to be able to integrate playbooks into the operator workflow. So as uh, this comes with scaling our tradecraft knowledge. So right now we store a lot of our knowledge in, in our own personal note files. Maybe it's in a wiki. We have links to different uh, pages uh, on the internet. And so but that requires us, you know, as we're attacking a network, to know about those wiki pages, to be able to, you know, go and search for those things. So rather than requiring the operator to go outside of their tool, somewhere else to figure out this information, we want to bring it into their workflow. So for example, if we find an AWS cred, we can immediately give suggestions of like, okay, here's some different ways that you can use this AWS credential. This is how you can log on using it. Um, and then maybe provide even references there within their viewpoint uh, of how to, uh, of where else they can go to learn uh, more about that specific technology. Um, we, we can also use this so as we're you know, collecting this data, we can naturally track our progression in an assessment. We can see you know, what hosts we've compromised, we can see what resources we've accessed, documents we've downloaded, and kind of the insights that we've gleaned from this data, maybe where passwords come from. And we can start piecing together uh, and tracking our progress uh, during an engagement. And this, you know, this is very useful for analytics as well as reporting purposes. <clears throat> and then finally, our third long-term goal is enhancing our knowledge sharing, coordination, and reporting. So um, as we're aggregating all of this data, we can now leverage this data for future research projects now. We don't have to have access to a live network. We have already collected it, so we can query that data and gain potentially new insights. So we can do research into somebody's network, even if we don't have physical access to that network. Um, we can also use this as a platform for discovering you know, new attack paths. So maybe, um, you know, maybe we have access to the, like, the information about like, services on a machine, and a new attack technique comes out attacking services, and we wanna check if a you know, organization is vulnerable to that technique. Even though we don't have access to their environment, we can look at the data we've collected so far and make that determination rather than having to access, have access to a live network. So that brings us to kind of what Nemesis is, what our vision is for Nemesis. It's a centralized data processing platform that's going to ingest data from all the tools that we're using. It's going to enrich that data and then perform a bunch of analytics uh, on offensive security data. So basically as, as we're doing assessments, we're gonna collect all this data in, enrich it, analyze it, and do as much as we can for the operator to assist them in their analysis of a network. By no means is this like trying to automate red teaming and pen testing. We're, we're, we're red teamers and pen testers. We know that's kind of a joke uh, in our opinion, uh, but we really wanna aid and assist operators in, as they're looking at networks. One also way to kind of look at this is potentially like a virus total for red team engagements. Another way to kind of think about it is from the blue side, Defenders have been collecting data from networks and from systems in order to understand adversaries for a long time. We want to take that same kind of approach of data-driven gathering and analysis, but from an offensive perspective. So that's a lot of higher level, what our goals, what our vision, kind of what it is in a you know, thousand foot view. We're going to dive all the way down and actually show you what Nemesis actually is. So also, you don't, as an operator, when you're, even just when you're using this, you don't need to know how all these pieces work. Um, I'm just gonna go over some of the internals, but this is abstracted away, so unless you're a developer on it, you don't need to know how every piece fits together. But ultimately, it's a Kubernetes-based system. I know some people will probably roll their eyes. I heard some people at lunch talking about how much they love Kubernetes, but the reason we picked this architecture is we wanted something that could run locally on a host as well as deploy to the cloud and scale for larger engagements or numbers of engagements. 
So all the way on the left, we're going to start with what our C2 kind of data sources are, whether stage one, Cobalt Strike, Mythic, Interpreter, things like that. Each one of these C2 frameworks or external tools will have a connector. These connectors just take data or files from these C2 frameworks and then post them to the Nemesis Web API. This is an abstracted, well-defined Web API that takes data in different structured forms, which we'll cover in a second. That API will take this data and then stuff it into RabbitMQ, which is the message queue we have on the back end. And each kind of message as stuff is coming in, let's say a, a file is downloaded. The file will be uploaded to Nemesis. It will be stored in a data lake, either S3 or MinIO, if it's contained within the cluster. Then a message will be published to the queue saying, I have a new file download. As that message kind of goes along, it'll get different enrichments for different microservices. So we have things like extract all the text from any office file at all, like there's a million different formats. Do OCR in any image and extract that text. Convert any office document to PDFs. So run something like Nosy Parker, which is a high performance regex engine focused on passwords. Run that in any text that kind of happens. Check any, any binary that comes by, check if it's .NET. If it is, run deserialization checks. If it's source code, index it into an Elasticsearch index for searching. Do, there's a bunch of like NLP, natural language processing stuff we do on text, things that we're starting to build up. Lots of different enrichments that will happen. After it goes to the enrichment flow, the data in its enriched form will be stored in a semi-structured way in Elasticsearch database that has a Gabbana engine on top of it, as well as a highly structured form into Postgres that is ingested by the dashboard that we're gonna show. And all throughout this, we have tons of logging for Fluentd, Prometheus, all that kind of fun stuff. So this is an example enrichment flow. We have a, an assembly that gets downloaded, like in that kind of first Red Team story that we had. That assembly, as it's starting to be enriched, it will have things like the metadata extracted, so version info, imports, type ref hashes, all that kind of fun stuff, signatures, blah, blah, blah. We'll also check for any like deserialization and command injection vulnerabilities using an automatic tool. And this just happens within seconds of you downloading the file without you having to do anything. Uh, we'll also decompile the assembly to .NET source and then zip that up and offer that as an easy way for you to download. So again, all this happens within a couple of seconds. It's that entire first level one triage flow that's just done automatically. And if there are any interesting results, stuff will just be posted to Slack. You can optionally just have Slack alerts of like, oh, I have a deserialization you know, bu uh, bug that popped up in this assembly. Then all of that information is going to be stored into Postgres and Elastic in the back end, and then you're going to use the Nemesis dashboard to interact with it in various ways that we'll show, or Kibana to do freeform searching for that kind of NoSQL semi-structured form. Uh, there's tons of different enrichments. We don't have time to go through all of them, but anything from process categorization, DP API, building custom cracking lists, you know, scanning stuff with Yara, cookie processing, all this type of stuff. And this is just an example of the raw enriched data. This isn't what we're going to interact with on an everyday basis, but this is what's actually shown in something like Kambana or Elastic. No, it's a little kind of hard to see. The text is a bit small, but you have you know, all the different types of hashes. You have the imports. You have version info. Uh, and you can search, because it's Elastic. You could search across every assembly that's been downloaded for the entire engagement, or previous engagements, if you keep stuff going. And we also have these little deserialization gadgets that popped up from a deserialization analysis tool written by Matt Hand. So again, this is the, uh, the raw enriched data. We're going to show how that's actually processed and how you actually interact with this data and what you can do with it when we show the demos for the Nemesis dashboard. And this, this raw data is very useful because we can use it in these different workflows that we do as an operator, whether it's local privilege escalation. So we could be analyzing it for vulnerabilities, reverse engineering just to learn how it works, or if we're just you know, looking for like strings and discovery throughout the network. A few quick notes, though, to back up one quick second on data collection. So everything starts with data collection, and there's a couple of challenges that go along with this from the offensive standpoint. The first is what we call batch versus incremental ingestion. So we can collect data from multiple sources, from multiple different C2s. We're just getting posts to a raw API. This presents a specific modeling challenge, as you can't know when the collection for a particular thing is complete. 
So for example, Windows services on a Windows host are ultimately, all the information about those services are presented in Windows registry keys. You could download maybe half the registry keys in one batch in like a C2 batch, but what if you have a long callback interval, you can get the next batch later. So these service abstractions that we actually build and we model from this data have to be able to be supported uh, piecemeal. Because we don't know, have we collected all the, have we finished collecting all the data about services or not? So it's a weird particular kind of modeling thing that you guys shouldn't have to worry about, but we've spent a lot of time in a, I don't know how many dozens of hours of whiteboard sessions trying to deal with this. The other big problem is information compression. So historically, a lot of offensive tools, you'll run the tool on the host, and it'll return interesting information to you. For example, PowerUp, which is a PowerShell Privest tool, will pull all this data from a host, do the analysis on the host, and then tell you these are the vulnerabilities. Since you're, not re you're enumerating all the data, but you're not returning all the data, a lot of that information is essentially compressed and lost. So let's say you find a new way to abuse a particular service. If that check wasn't present in the tool you ran on host, then you have now lost that information. But if you pull all the raw data, you're already enumerating the raw data, so if you pull all that raw data back to a backend analysis server, then you can do additional analysis as stuff kind of comes up. You have like the raw ground truth, and then you implement your analysis you know, incrementally, and you can do retro analysis and things like this. So this is what can definitely help support um, additional automations and researching new attack paths, things like that. Now, we'll, so we had collecting the data itself, some of the challenges, and then the actual tool integrations for Nemesis. Our goal is to uh, collect data from any and all tooling used in engagements. So integrating with Nemesis is just posting data to Web API. That's it. Uh, this what type of message you post to the API is well-structured and well-defined. We have an ODR, um, an offensive data reference that's well-defined for things like file listings, file data, process listings, services, network connections, things like that. So it's the connector's responsibility to take that structured data and post it to Nemesis. And we have pre-built connectors with different amounts of capabilities for Cobalt Strike, Mythic, Metasploit, OST Stage 1, Sliver. We also have a Chrome plugin that we're going to demonstrate, and we're working on other connectors as well. So our goal was to have Oprah throw, you know, everyone gets an integration for every single possible different thing. But we, while, you know, the Meterper connector is not as fully featured as the Metas or as the, the Cobalt Strike one, um, this is just a matter of like building out you know, additional things. The easiest thing to actually integrate is just automatic file download processing. Like it's a file is downloaded, post it up with a little bit of metadata to Nemesis and let all the magic stuff happen. Cool, and that kind of brings us to you know offensive data analysis that we do uh, with all this data that's coming in now. Like ultimately, our goal, like I said, is to assist operators. We want to do that kind of level one analysis of every possible thing that comes in. We want to just take that load off of operators. There's a lot of annoying things that we have to deal with. All this copying files around, syncing files around, converting it to different formats. We want to automate as much as that possible so that and so that operators can do what, be, what they're best at, which is analyzing an environment rather than fighting with tools and trying to figure out how they work. Um, this is also really nice because once we've aggregated all this data together, we can now start analyzing it and, um, and, and by building these relationships between different data types, we can do some really cool uh, analytics. So you can think about like files. Files have information like uh, a security information that has information about like users. Well, Active Directory has all of the user information. So now you can correlate, you know, Active Directory information with, you know, the security info and files. You can for can for access maybe who's accessing these files. Um, you can do things like network connections and processes and files. You can kind of correlate all of these different data types and start using it in your analytics for these different workflows that an operator has to do. So. It, Aggregating all this uh, ultimately allows this type of analysis, which hasn't been possible before. And ultimately, once we do all this analysis, we want to give this back to the operator so that they can make decisions based off of it. We're not saying that Nemesis is always going to be 100% right um, or that it's going to do everything by any means, but we want to expose and surface this data to operators so they become aware of what's possible and that they can better analyze the, the environment.
So some of the automations that we do, uh, some of these Will has already mentioned. So with like .NET assemblies, we automatically download them, decompile them, scan them for vulnerabilities, extract PE information. If they're normal PE files, it'll extract things like the exports, the imports, a lot of stuff that you'd want for like reverse engineering. Um, for Office documents, we automatically download them, convert them to a PDF so you can just view them in a browser. You don't have to open up Microsoft Word or anything. We extract out the text, put it in a searchable form so that you can search that from within Nemesis. Um, all files, they're scanned for DPAPI data as well as other credentials. If it does have DPAPI data, this is that Windows Data Protection API, has a certain format, but what Nemesis will do is it'll discover any of that encrypted data, automatically extract it, store it, and then once you have the encryption keys, it will retroactively go and decrypt all of this data as well. Um, it has, uh, it will do automatic hash extraction for certain different uh, types of data. So if you download, download like a protected Word document, it will extract a hash, throw it into a hash cracker, a simple hash cracking service that we have, and automatically try and brute force at least a baseline set of passwords that, um, to kind of cover your bases. Um, all, um, like, all binary, well, non-binary files, so text files, are scanned by Nosy Parker, which is just it's a really good scanning engine that will look for like passwords and credentials. Um, and then uh, any archive that you may download, so whether it's a zip file, tar file, et cetera, it'll extract that, analyze all of the files inside of it, and do this same kind of processing. Again, saving the operator the trouble of having to download it, extract it, and then try and upload it back into Nemesis. Um, Another cool thing is we analyze registry keys. So when we download like a registry hive, we can automatically, um, based off those registry keys, we can build a model of like the services in a network, and then we can do service analysis just based off of this registry data. Um, and then once we've aggregated all of this data, how and, and have done all this analysis, we can actually view it, the operator will view it inside of what we call the Nemesis dashboard, which is just a web UI, and that's where they're gonna view that data. They can triage it, so they can also discard something if it's not useful and, and so it's not viewed anymore, and they can do additional analysis within this view as well. Do things like make comments um, and you know, discard data if they don't, they don't wanna see it anymore. So with that, we are going to dive into the demos so you can actually see what Nemesis is looking like. So uh, this, is the, uh, this is the Cobalt Strike interface. So this is what typically I as a, you know, if I'm doing a pen test or something, uh, I might be using Cobalt Strike. And what you're seeing here is a file listing. And so I see an interesting file there and I'm gonna go ahead and issue a command to download it. And so what happens there is we've already hooked up Nemesis into Cobalt Strike. And when I download that file, you can see down at the bottom that it spits out a bunch of information that Nemesis automatically did to analyze that file. And one of the analysis things that Nemesis does is deserialization vulnerability checks. And so it spits out a little notification saying, hey, this has deserialization primitives in it. You should go take a look at this. So we'll go to the interface, we'll refresh it. We can see there's now a file, that's the file we just downloaded. We'll go to the file listing. This is a high level listing of all the files that we've downloaded so far. You can get a good little overview of some of the, the the information about the files. We can see that it is a magic, like it's a PE file. You can of course download the file if you want, but uh, you can also view that raw file in the interface. One of the features here, because it is a .NET assembly, we've automatically decompiled the, the, the application because .NET is very easy to decompile. So we can go ahead and download that automatically decompiled source code and you can see that's where the, the file is, and now we are going to unzip it. And you can see the actual source code in there, and you can see it, we've highlighted binary formatter that is a known deserialization primitive, and we can quickly do our analysis just by looking at the code and see that there is a, you know, maybe a, dis a vulnerability in this .NET binary. In addition to that, we can look at the detailed information about this file. Um, in Nemesis, and so 
in the interface, it will show a textual view of it down here at the bottom in a code editor. Uh, since it's a PE file, it's all binary data. But we can also look at the raw data that Nemesis um, uh, extracted from the PE file. So here you can see things like um, the, DLL, uh, the DLL imports that are there. It automatically extracts that PE metadata information, so like the version of the PE file. Um, you can also see because it's a .NET binary, it tells you the version of .NET. And it's also telling you all of the, like, uh, the types and the functions used inside of that .NET binary. So this is very useful. Uh, from a vulnerability and reverse engineering perspective to have all this data automatically aggregated uh, for me. So now we can do like analytics, uh, build additional analytics based off of that collected data too. So for the second demo, uh, we're gonna show off the Chrome extension that Nemesis has. So if you're not, if you don't do many like pen tests or red teaming, a common thing that we have to do is, you know, maybe we'll get access into a network and they have like an internal wiki or maybe they have a source code repository or like SharePoint or something. And there's a lot of files there and we need to go there and download files from the internal network. So we'll set up a SOX proxy and pipe our traffic through our browser into the target network and then start downloading files. So that's the, the intended use case of this Chrome extension. So what we've done here is when we have it installed, we have we set up the configuration for Nemesis. So this is our unique identifier that you uh, for me, um, and then we configure you know where the, where the Nemesis API is, and then Nemesis has you know a username and password for authentication. So we submit that we've now configured Nemesis. So now we can you know go and. You know, we could, maybe we're doing OSINT on a network too, and we're, we, want, we find some files, we could download all those, or if we're accessing SharePoint or the wiki or whatever, we're gonna start downloading files, and when we download them, they automatically get sent into Nemesis, and that's what you're seeing there is a nice notification that it's been uploaded. So now we'll go to the, the Nemesis dashboard, and we'll reload, we can see our file was processed there. When we go to the file listing, um, we can see some information about that file. Uh, it was a dot .doc file, so this is a Word document. And so we can you know, download it if we wanted. Uh, we can view the raw data, so I'll go ahead and click that. This is just, again, there's a little bit of binary data. This is useful for, most, most useful for unknown file types. Uh, you can kind of just look what's inside of there real quick. Uh, because this is a Word document, Nemesis auto converts it to a PDF, so you can quickly view it in the browser. So this makes triaging Word documents so, so much easier. So you don't have to go open up like OpenOffice or, or Microsoft Word. Um, another thing Nemesis does, uh, well, here's the detailed view of that file. Uh, you can, you know, if you wanted to look at like what's inside of that file without leaving the browser. Uh, because it is a Word document, any sort of Office document, Nemesis will extract the text out of it automatically and index it. And we have a few different search functions in here. So here we have a, a keyword-based search inside of Nemesis. And so we search for passwords, and you can see we found a password there. Uh, you can also see up here in the top right, it says semantic search. So you can use just like natural language to ask questions about any of the downloaded downloaded documents, and it will return semantic search results. So based off of the, the, the sentence that you, you asked. All right. Okay, next demo. We have Nosy Parker and automatic hash cracking. People usually like this one. So Cobalt Strike again. We're going to download two files. One's an encrypted zip test, and one's a google.config. Spoiler, encrypted zip, zip test is an encrypted zip. So when that gets pulled down, Nemesis will automatically detect that it's encrypted and used some of that, you know, John type extraction on the back end. Oh, for, sorry, first, before we get to the encrypted zip, we're going to show the Google config, which this config has no nosy Parker results. So we see that in that basic, in that basic, uh, uh, so in that initial kind of triage. We go to more file details. We see the raw kind of file underneath in that file browser type thing. There's actually a Monaco code editor. So if source code gets pulled down, it actually gets rendered like his Visual Studio code underneath for you, and you have all the Visual Studio normal functionality. We see here there's nosy Parker results. We see the raw elastic stuff like we've been showing before. 
But if there are Nosy Parker results, you can click on that. And again, well, if there are Nosy Parker results, it'll actually throw alerts up into Slack, so you know to actually go here. And this shows you, oh, there's a Google OAuth access token, you know, matching here with that particular context. Everything means syntax highlighted. Open API, API key, this is all just sample fake data. Again, this is stuff that you could do if you're running Nosy Parker manually, but this just happens automatically and you just get alerts into Slack with contextual links back to the Nemesis dashboard. For the encrypted zip, te uh, encrypted zip test, we see that it's encrypted. If we go to hashes, that hash of that document was automatically extracted and stored in the backend database. So we see, uh, and in this case, that hash is resubmitted back into Nemesis, into the pipeline, and we have a basic top 10,000 kind of word password cracking list that will attempt any hash that kind of comes through. So we see it actually cracked it, password one, two, three, bang, and you know, we can link back to the contextual document and stuff. So you could actually extend this if you wanted to and say take any hashes that don't crack and like shoot them off into an API for your own cracking rig. So it's cool. It's like without even knowing that the zip was downloaded, it extracted the hash and cracked it and then alerted you if it was actually cracked. This is also super cool because it's, it's just like a baseline set of things that you're doing against you know uh, these password every, hashes. And it's every file you download. Yeah. You don't have to rely upon an operator to have to do this manually one by yeah. one. Uh, I've been on several assessments where I may have downloaded a document or downloaded something that was encrypted and had a hash, but just because of the effort it takes to like extract the hash, like set up the password cracker and everything, I didn't do that, and maybe my team member did, and it ends up being some dumb password, like password one, two, three. And so you can see the value in just like doing this for every single kind of You're hash. You're consistency across yeah. every file you triage. Uh, the next example is some of that, that oof deep API stuff I was talking about. So. I'm, I don't have time. <laughs> it would take about half an hour to explain DP API in depth, but suffice to say that we're going to show some Chrome examples here where we have the login data Chrome file. This is where all your saved Chrome passwords are stored. They're encrypted, so I'm going to download that. Then the keys for that login data file are stored in the local state file. That's one directory up. This is just in your, your app data. So that local state has all the encryption keys. The keys in that local state are encrypted using the DP API master keys that are set per user. That was in that first screenshot that I'm gonna show here. So I'm just downloading these. I'm just downloading the raw data. Nemesis is going to know that that Chrome login data was linked to that state key, that local state, and those linked to those master keys. So we see that there's gonna be some logins that are processed. We're gonna to go to the Chromium page, go to the Logins tab, we'll actually see that they're all encrypted still. We don't have the decryption keys yet because the master keys have not been decrypted yet. So because the master keys aren't decrypted, that means the local state isn't decrypted and so on and so forth. So no, it's a little hard to see there, but it says is decrypted false. So we know that our Chrome stuff is not triaged yet. But for DP API, for master keys, there's a universal domain DP API backup key that's stored in the DC. So assuming we have domain admin rights, we can retrieve that key. It's gonna automatically ingest it into Nemesis using the Cobalt Strike plugin, and that will retroactively decrypt any linked master keys, and then any linked master keys will retroactively decrypt any state keys, so on and so forth. So that entire chain of four or five different steps was just done automatically for us, and just the moment that we pulled that, that master key in, so now we see the login has been decrypted to password one, two, three, bang, and this is all a sortable table. This is all just stored in Postgres in the back end, and you can pull stuff out. And we see also in the DP API overview page, we see master keys have actually been, you know, they're linked to a particular state key. So again, we, we do a lot of DP API and like cookie abuse and uh, those types of abuses. This just automates all of those pieces. All right, last demo, and then we'll go over some concluding thoughts. We have a registry collection buff. So with Cobalt Strike and most other C2s, it's difficult to get serialized data from the actual executing client back to the C2 host. This is a problem across a lot of C2 frameworks. To help deal with this, our workmate Max built a beacon object file, a BOF, that will collect raw registry keys, serialize it to a format, automatically stream that file back, and it gets pulled into Nemesis. So we're gonna say BOF reg collect, we're gonna specify HKLM current control set services. This is the section of the registry that has all the data that details 
uh, configuration information about a Windows service. It gets pulled back automatically, nothing's touching disk, everything gets thrown into Nemesis. And we see in the Postgres backend, uh, data was pulled out, and we start seeing the raw registry keys will get populated here in just a couple of seconds. So these are all the multiple different pieces that are these raw reg keys. And like, this can be useful, searching across lots of stuff. But what's really useful is we can take these keys and then actually construct a service abstraction. So we can say this is a, an actual Windows service with this SDDL and this configuration and this type of stuff. And then the next step for us that we're developing is to be able to do like local privilege uh, escalation analysis and things like that based on all this raw extracted data. All right, there's a lots of, uh, lots of fire hose demos. So some people might be thinking, well, this isn't really new like enrichment pipelines are something that lots of different industries have done. Uh, our argument is that no one has properly applied this, at least publicly, to offensive security. We assume that this type of thing has been done by other people privately, but to our knowledge, an offensive enrichment pipeline has not existed publicly yet. But more to the point, I'll let Lee answer this question. Yeah, so why does all this really matter? Um, a lot of it is not, you know, we've talked a lot about it, a lot of things today, and a lot of the cool stuff about Nemesis isn't just what it does now, which is you know really cool in, in our opinion, but it's really what it's going to allow us to do in the future, which is offensive data analytics. And so before you can start doing a lot of data analysis, you have to have a foundation of data to actually query and look at. And so that's what we're building is this platform on which we can analyze offensive security data. And this is going to lead to some really cool re research that we're excited about and and excited to present on that you know, more in the future. Um, and this is a big kind of paradigm shift for red teamers, a lot of, uh, and, and pen testers in general. A lot of it's very manual right now. A lot of it is, uh, you know, requires us running tools, kind of seeing what's going on. Um, and we're kind of getting to this point now to where we can leverage, you know, maybe not specific red teamers or, or people uh, specific like pen testers need to be on target. We can have people kind of on the back end analyzing the data and assisting the operators in their work as well. So this is kind of where the offensive data analyst role comes into play. So there's a lot of advantages. You know, we've kind of already talked about this. We can uh, essentially update, you know, operator workflows. So as new Tradecraft comes out, we can, it's going to affect all of our operators once we add it into Nemesis. Um, uh, the really cool thing about this too is like, let's say we find a new piece of Tradecraft, a new vulnerability. That thing will be checked from here on forward in perpetuity across all assessments for every single operator, you know, forever now. So this is like we've we we were on an assessment and we found a you know a, a new vulnerability, a new deserial, a new vulnerability primitive, and we added it on the fly into Nemesis, and now all you know 30 of our team members are going to benefit from that you know newly discovered thing forever. <clears throat> Um, you know, offline pro processing allows us to look at the data, you know, even if we don't have access to the network anymore. Um, it's going to minimize our footprint as well when we're, perform when we're running our tools. So right now, a lot of offensive tools have two kind of things that they do. They collect data and they analyze data. Uh, by removing that analysis portion from the tool, we are, our tools are no longer as big, they're lighter weight, and they don't have to do as much malicious-like functionality, which may make them more evasive um, from like EDR and antivirus on endpoints. Um, and all of this collected and, and unstructured data is, you know, we can actually use that data now to guide further research efforts. So now that it's been aggregated, modeled, and everything, we can now analyze that data, maybe identify new attack paths, uh, new, uh, maybe new vulnerabilities that we didn't realize were there during the assessment, and we can better assess networks as a whole. So Thank you. This is our first time speaking at St. Con. It's been awesome. No, we're just, just about at time, so I think if people have any questions, we're going to be out kind of in the hallway if you want to chat about any of this stuff. We also have open DMs. We have, you know, emails, you know, whatever else. We, we, we're also on the Bloodhound Slack under our handles. We would love to chat with anybody. All the code is open source. Everything is free. It's all on GitHub under SpectreOps slash Nemesis. We have a series of guides. We know it's not like the most lightweight tool to get going. We have a um, ton of documentation. Uh, this is under active development. We have, um, we're already planning our next dev sprint on some of this kind of stuff. So I'm um, gonna thank you all very much for, for letting us uh, come and talk to you guys for a bit. Thank you.